Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. Education truly is poverty's mortal enemy. A former governor and her passion for what ails Louisiana. To me, the story of Kennedy deciding not to run is what the governor did to dissuade him from running. How the next race for governor is shaping up. When we took our first torpedo, uh, it knocked out our electricity. Louisiana veterans who were there remember Pearl Harbor. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, a look at some other stories making headlines across Louisiana. Louisiana is receiving $11 million as its share of a multi-state settlement with Deutsche Bank over the manipulation of a key benchmark involving global interest rates. Of the settlement, Attorney General Jeff Landry's office says $3 million will go to the Bond Commission and $8 million to the Transportation Department. Landry's office says 45 state attorneys general were involved in the investigation and the resulting $220 million settlement with Deutsche Bank. A serious new illness that causes weakness in the arms and legs and mostly affects children has been found in a patient in Louisiana, the first such case to be reported in the state. That's according to the Centers for Disease Control. The illness is known as acute flaccid myelitis. The CDC would not give the location of the case in the state or the age of the patient. So far in 2018, there are 116 confirmed cases of AFM in 31 states. The State Department of Health and CDC have closed a Boy Scout camp at Avondale as they look into two cases of a disease that sent two campers to the hospital. LDH says at least 15 campers were exposed to histoplasmosis. It's a disease spread through exposure to soil contaminated with bat or bird droppings. It's not contagious, and infection does not always mean sickness. Symptoms are typically flu-like, meaning fever, cough, chills, and headache. A federal judge sentenced five men to two to five years in prison for their roles in a 2012 explosion that created a 7,200-foot mushroom cloud in the sky. The strange saga involved turning a Louisiana National Guard facility into what prosecutors called the largest illegal dumping ground of military explosives in the history of the U.S. On October 15, 2012, the munitions dramatically exploded. The blast shattered windows within a four-mile radius, derailed 11 rail cars, and spurred the evacuation of the nearby town of Doyline. The Restore Louisiana program says homeowners in floodways can receive up to $200,000 for their home if they're willing to move out. Program Executive Director Pat Forbes says the buyouts help people relocate from risky flood-prone areas and improves water flow during a flood with potential debris removed. Only those who have already applied in the program are eligible. Blues legend Buddy Guy will be honored in his hometown of Letsworth in Point Coupee Parish this weekend. During the Saturday ceremony, Louisiana and Mississippi officials will declare Buddy Guy Day. They'll unveil a marker and designate Highway 418 in Letsworth as Buddy Guy Way. It was a week of who's in in the 2019 Louisiana governor's race. I talked with political historian Bob Mann from LSU's Manship School of Journalism and Greg Hilburn of the Monroe News Star and USA Today newspapers. 
Thanks so much for joining us. And a couple of big news items this week. The most recent, Ralph Abraham throwing his hat into the governor's race. Your thoughts on that, Bob? Well, I think that uh, it's he, he's an interesting candidate and he's a sitting member of Congress, so not a minor candidate by any standpoint, but he's also from the least populous part of the state with uh, uh, all due respect <laughs> to my friend Greg, he's from that neck of the woods, but it's really hard, I think, for, uh, and it's historically it's been hard for people to get elected statewide office from a very small geographical base. He's got some reach into this part of into, you know, the Baton Rouge area, but I think that's a big challenge to him. He just, he's not well known and he doesn't represent the geographical uh, center of the state. And so it's gonna, be a, it's gonna be difficult. And Greg, with uh, the Monroe News Star plus USA Today newspapers, that is an area you know very well. You know his people very well. So what's your gut reaction to this? Well, I'm, I, I sense that he wanted to run for governor and he had talked about it for months now. Uh, and I think uh, Senator Kennedy's exit from the race opened the door for him and he felt like this was an opportunity he had to take. He's got a really good story. He was a veterinarian, went to LSU, and then went back to school to be a human doctor. He says he can treat anything on two or four feet. Uh, he's a pilot, he, he's right? A, he's a pilot. He does Coast Guard rescue missions. And, and still does, right? Yeah, still does. He's flown into the, uh, uh, with the Hurricane Hunters. He's got a really good story, but it takes money to tell that story. Okay. Now, let's go back to Kennedy's announcement uh, on non Monday that he would not run. And this came as a huge shock to a lot of people. Was a shock to you, Greg? Well, I, because it's Senator Kennedy and his un unpredictability, it wasn't a shock. But I was certainly surprised. I mean, I, I thought he was going to run. Who schedules an announcement other than Senator Kennedy to announce that you're not going to Right. Of course, and he does the announcement by, by Twitter and press release, so that does subdue the fact he didn't set up a news conference right. where cameras would be there, Bob. Yeah, I, you know, I think this, uh, to me the story of Kennedy deciding not to run is what the governor did to dissuade him from running. I think that's part of it is, is, is that the governor went around and uh, raised a lot of money and, and, uh, and gathered up support from a lot of prominent Republicans in the state. Uh, then pointed the advocate to that story, and, and they wrote a very prominent story about that. And then the other part of it was uh, Gumbo Pack, which which very instrumental, of, affiliated with, you know, supportive of Democrats that, that was very important in the last governor's race, attacking David Vitter, started these, these preemptive tax, uh, attacks on Kennedy over the weekend to show him, this is what's going to come your way if you run. And I think that, you know, and also some polling that showed the governor not as weak as some people thought he was. Um, might have made Kennedy take a second look at this thing late, late in the game and say, well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm happier being here in the Senate where I've got a safe seat. Yeah, both the polling uh, showing Kennedy and the governor at about 60 percent uh, in the plus column. And uh, Kennedy, of course, saying that it was a recent trip to China that made him feel like, oh, well, this is where I can do the most good in the Senate. But take a look at this quote of his. And he says, I hope someone runs for governor who understands that Louisiana state government does not have to be big, slow, dumb, wasteful, sometimes corrupt, spend money like it was ditch water, anti-taxpayer, top-down institution. That is a great soundbite that people would love to run with uh, from Kennedy, but it's something he said about the Louisiana governor's chair. So what is your reaction to that first? Well, a Senator Kennedy has always had a fractious relationship uh, with, with not just this governor, who's a Democrat, but Any governor, the right. previous governor, who's a Republican, but kind of the chief critic watched, considered, put himself in a watchdog position. And so he's, a, he's and he's also, um, he's also if a loner, I think, in a lot of ways. He doesn't, you know, he's, he doesn't pal around with his colleagues when he was in the state house, nor when he's in uh, Congress. And so, you know, I think that he's, he, he, he's, of course, he can, these sound bites, he can uh, spin like no one else. Well, and that's why he's really strengthened his footing nationally with, uh, with all the networks, because they haven't heard some of these things before. They can really jump on them and run with them. Of course, it makes it sound like Kennedy is just your next door neighbor down home on the farm. He's anything but that, Bob. Yeah, he is. And I just want to say, I think that statement to me, when I heard that statement, when I read that statement, I thought that's a guy who wishes he could run, but, it's not, but won't run because he doesn't think he can win. That, he wants to, that, that statement was, was not about why I'm not running. It's, it, the, the reading between the lines is I want to run as bad as anything, but I know I can't, I know I can't win. Oh, that is an interesting analysis. Of course, Governor Edwards, his response uh, 
uh, to Kennedy, this was never about the people of Louisiana. Um, and he says this was about focusing the spotlight on himself, on Kennedy. He likes to do that. He's very good. He's very, very good at focusing the spotlight on himself. And you know, you could also say that there, there, there may be some Republicans out there who were thinking about running, who stepped aside or Kennedy may have pushed aside and lost a lot of time in, in, in organizing and fundraising that even if they want to get into the race at this late date, can't do it or, have, or will have a much harder time doing it because Kennedy sort of froze the field or pushed people out. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that, that that decision that he made really won him a lot of friends in his party because he, he kind of cleared the field. Do you think there's anybody else who would jump back in or consider it now that wasn't considering it? And we'll talk about the people who are still, uh, who are going to run, uh, Responi, uh, Baton Rouge businessman, wealthy man, and uh, Sharon Hewitt, uh, still considering it. Well, uh, Mr. Responi has vowed to invest at least $5 million of his own fortune in the race and would like to, you know, Tell, have a similar story as the new governor of Tennessee as a businessman who was swept into office uh, by the people. And right now... And the U.S. president. Right now, he <laughs> and the governor, right, exactly, he and the governor are the only ones that have any money. So you have a Democrat in a sea of red who seems to be pretty strong now. Very. I think very. I mean, there's just, to me, the thing about the, the thing about the governor, and Greg can talk about this better than I can, I think, but, but you know, you look around and they're just... There, there may be people who just prefer not voting for Democrats, but, but John Bell Edwards has not made anybody really angry at him. He, the, the, the state's fiscal situation is much better, and it's just, I think it's really hard to find any one issue that just really angers anybody, especially Republicans, other than the fact they just would prefer to have a Republican in the governor's mansion. That's going to be a big, big factor in his, in his race coming up in, this, in the summer and through the fall. Final thought from you. I think anybody who's a Democrat, no matter how their popularity poll sh numbers show, is in peril. Though I think, of course, he has a good chance to win. I think whoever the Republican is in the runoff also has a good chance to win. I say, I say final thought, but this is something we're going to talk about. This is the beginning of the thoughts. Cause we're talk we'll talk about this a lot during the next year. Thanks so much for being here. I appreciate your time. Thank you. You know, graduation time for almost half of the college students in Louisiana is a double reality check time. Students are entering the real world with careers on their mind, but 48% of them also owe money for the education that they've just received. The average debt per student who borrowed is almost $27,000. That's the 19th lowest in the nation. It's still a lot of money. The average debt for those who borrowed in LSU's 2017 graduation class is just under $25,000. Now, we hear a lot about the TOPS scholarships, but here to talk about TOPS and some of the other programs, some of the other grants for students, Brittany Williams and Kayla Grow. They're from the State Office of Student Financial Aid. TOPS has a number of types of scholarships. So Kayla, why don't you mention quickly run down what yeah. some of those are. So TOPS has three tiers, um, the opportunity level, the performance level, and the honors level. The opportunity level will be the base scholarship where you get the tuition award as you go up to the performance and the honors. Students are eligible to get um, an additional stipend and that'll be based on their GPA as well as their ACT scores. Now there's a Pell Grant, which used to be really the most popular type of aid that you would hear about mm -hmm. before TOPS even uh, came into being. Can you get a TOPS and a Pell Grant at the same time? Yes, you can. Uh, so Pell Grant is going to be need-based aid, whereas TOPS is uh, merit-based, okay. so it does not affect each other. And there's a big difference between uh, a scholarship and a grant, for example, because a grant, you don't have to make a certain GPA, if I'm understanding that correctly. You've got scholarships, grants, and you've got college savings plans. Mm -hmm. You can talk about some of those things. Yes, yes. So um, grants are um, income-based. The awarding of grants, for example, the Pell Grant, um, is need-based um, from the federal government, um, as opposed to TOPS being a merit-based um, aid. Um, we also have a 529 
college savings account and that is neither a grant or a scholarship but this is a tool created for parents to be able to keep up with rising tuition costs. And what your office does is is instruct people uh, and tell people about these things and tell them how to work with them. Yes. You don't hand out money. No, we don't. You don't have that. That'd be nice <laughs> if you did, but, but you do uh, tell people all about these and that's one of the reasons we yes. want you here today because student debt is high yes. but uh, there are some ways that maybe students aren't taking advantage of and you've got uh, many others that I had not heard of before uh, Chafee you have uh, LA Able John R Justice what are some of these the Rockefeller scholarship what are so some of these the Chafee um, voucher is for students that were in foster care and have aged out all they have to do is complete their FAFSA. As for most of the items that we offer within our office, you complete that FAFSA. And you mentioned that. What is that I'm exactly? I'm sorry. The uh, FAFSA is the application. It's the uh, free application for federal student aid. And this is something um, all students who are finishing high school are yes. going to know about because yes. they have to fill out these forms. Yes. yes. It okay. is now a requirement for graduation for Louisiana students. Okay. Uh, so they just have to fill that out. That uh, application will go to their institution and then their institution will highlight them and send that to our office to let us know that we can send money to uh, give to the students that okay. they built. Some of the others that I, that I mentioned, and there are others, mm -hmm. a, a Go Grant, etc. What are some of those others involved? So the Go Grant is kind of tied to the Pell Grant, um, but the Go Grant is a state-based grant. It's free money, and based on a student's need, they could be eligible for that aid at their institution. And again, that application to receive it is by completing the FAFSA. And so once that is complete, if they're eligible, they will receive it. What's the main thing that you want people sitting at home hearing you right now to hear? to complete the FAFSA as soon as possible. Um, make sure to follow us on social media, on our Facebook, um, our YouTube, our Instagram. And they can call and contact you also, yes, right? Definitely yes. call and ask us. a lot of questions, yes. ask what's what's available. Yes. Is there a scholarship that is uh, underutilized right now, or, or a grant that you have that's underutilized? The Rockefeller, for sure. Really? Um, we definitely need more applicants for that Rockefeller scholarship. Um, so if students are in wildlife and forestry, uh, marine science go ahead and apply for that scholarship don't leave that money on the table um, because we have to use it so we want to make sure it's going to our students that are in those fields what is the website that people contact you at uh, osfa.la.gov okay we'll make sure that people get that Thanks so much for joining us. Anything else you want to add to this very quickly? Um, I do want to give our um, email address. They can contact our office okay. and have um, financial aid specialists answer questions um, about the FAFSA if they have They're any They're standing questions. by to answer questions, <laughs> Yes, right? we are. Okay, so what's that, what's that, what's that email? Um, it's go, G-E-A-U-X, FAFSA, F-A-F-S-A dot L-A dot gov. That's spelled out on your screen right now, <laughs> so you'll see that. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Former Governor Kathleen Blanco says there's no escape from the incurable cancer that has spread throughout her body. This week, she was honored by Council for a Better Louisiana, and she gave what many say felt like a farewell speech. Please know I believe with all my heart that the prayers offered on my behalf have carried me this far leading me to good doctors whose work is keeping me alive today. It's your prayers that lift my spirit and keep me from feeling the wrath of this terrible disease, but there's no escape. The monster is not far down the road, creeping, its, uh, creeping up to have its way with me. So I ask you to please just keep praying for me and my family as we battle the beast, and I'll pray for those of you who pray for me. Governor, you and your family are in our prayers. Cable gave Blanco the Robert B. Ham Award for Distinguished Service. You know, education is one of her lifelong passions and causes. She talked about education being the path to defeat poverty and to lift up Louisiana. Education truly is poverty's mortal enemy. So investing in educators and the work that they do for our children is never a waste. I get quite angry when I hear that, hear some policymakers defining investments in education as a waste of taxpayer money. And sometimes you'll hear, oh, you can't throw money at education to solve the problems. 
Well, I'd like to know what problems are ever solved without additional money of any kind, anywhere in our world. It's just an excuse for refusing to keep it properly supported. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the philosophy that keeps us in the tank. So I would like to say that it is very easy to demonstrate to policymakers that poverty is just way too expensive, and that ought to be enough rationale to change their philosophy. We really cannot afford poverty. Poverty forces us to support undereducated adults who only qualify for the lowest paid jobs in our society. They make too little to afford health insurance, so we have to pay for health insurance. The, <clears throat> the jails cost more individually to keep people in prison than education costs. Every element of impoverished people's lives have to be supplemented. Their food and their housing must be subsidized. And so don't you think, and don't you agree, that it makes more economic sense to properly educate our citizens in the first place? That would be a huge step. Seventy-seven years ago today, December 7th, 1941, Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor led the U.S. into the entering of World War II. The surprise bombings killed more than 2,400 Americans and injured almost 1,200 more. From our Louisiana Digital Media Archives, this report from Charlie Wenham featuring some Louisiana servicemen who were there. I hope the United States will keep out of this war. I believe that it will. In September of 1940, America's Pacific Fleet was moved to Hawaii along with many Louisiana sailors. Ed Jones was on the California, first in a string of battleships tied together. You could see the, um, when the planes came in, they were flying very low, and I could see the bombs leaving the plane, hitting the buildings, blowing them up. But we, we didn't know what was happening because we wasn't at war. Willie Groves was also on Battleship Row, tied up next to the Oklahoma. We watched the two bombs come out the bottom of the plane like that and hit, and this hangar just blew up. And Frisky said, oh, my God, they're going to court-martial everybody on that island. Somebody forgot to take the warheads out the bomb. <laughs> John Zanka was across the harbor, a Louisiana eyewitness to the infamy. I heard this bugle call that sounded rather strange. It was like one long note. And I thought to myself, now what the heck is he trying to play? And then I heard him hollering, the Japs are attacking. I'll tell you what, I could actually see that pilot looking right at me like that. That's how close he was. We only had a single hull. Picture yourself in a large steel drum and somebody on the outside with a massive hammer. We could shoot at ships. We could shoot at shores. We had, couldn't shoot at an airplane. Oklahoma was alongside of us. Well, the first time she was hit, she rocked back and forth like this. And then she started over and she wasn't coming back. And just as she got about 15 degrees, Torpedoes hit her again, and she come back up, and she rocked and rolled for a while, and then she started over the third time, and they hit her again, and she come back up again, but by this time, she went all the way over, but seven torpedoes hit the Oklahoma. When we took our first torpedo, uh, it knocked out our electricity, and the ammunition hoist to send us up the ammunition wouldn't work, and the ventilators that get the fresh air to the men below wouldn't work, so everybody was down below was getting asphyxiated. I saw what I imagined Dante envisioned when he said Inferno. There was smoke hanging all over the harbor. The battleships and other ships burning. You could see fire all over. There was fire in the water. We could see the boats running around trying to find people in the water and picking up 
survivors, picking, still picking up survivors and still picking up dead bodies. Sunday night was, was trying to get the men, the injured, the, the ones that were still in the water, the men coming out of the Oklahoma, and, and they was running everything from the Maryland to cutting into the bottom of the Oklahoma. There were so many men in there hitting on the steel mm -hmm. that it sounded like a million beats. All you could hear was <laughs> We were talking to them on the phones. If any of us have trouble imagining the horror, ask any of these Louisiana vets. How shocked was our generation after terrorist attacks on New York and Washington 60 years later? That's how shocked the nation was then. America woke up that day and the men who survived fought on with fresh fortitude and a whole new commitment. For more stories like these, you can visit LPB's Louisiana Digital Media Archive. That's at ladigitalmedia.org. Tonight on LPB and PBS, George H.W. Bush, American Experience, a look back at the life and career of our 41st president, George H.W. Bush, who died a week ago today at the age of 94. That's tonight at 8, right here on LPB. And that's our show for this week, everyone. Remember, tomorrow is an election day in Louisiana. Exercise your right to vote. You can also watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app that downloads free from your app store. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.